Wait, wait up to now. <laughs> You have a three minutes, if yeah. you will like yeah. 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 it. Yeah, first of all, I have to say this was a great, uh, successful conference. I, I enjoyed it a lot. And first line, the very nice location it was really great. Great place there. <coughs> but also the, um, the um, presentation that were given. I mean, I, I'm one of the three person I just learned with joined all the five trips uh, so far taking place uh, seminars and I have to say that the quality Wait, of the contribution to join. So from the German and from the Russian side increases every, every time. This is, was really nice, I enjoyed it a lot and um, we realized also that this in situ uh, projects are increasing more and more. I think this time there were just a few presentations which are not really dealing with uh, in situ studies. So also this is something very nice indication that there's a huge progress uh, in, in this uh, research field. And in particular, the synchrotron radiation facility uh, project, they are developing quite a lot with more collaboration, but also other people who are not directly involved uh, are using these techniques uh, which make a huge progress within the last uh, years. And I think it's definitely worth to, to continue this, uh, this uh, seminars uh, uh, in the future, and maybe this time there were not so many participants compared to the last times, uh, in particular less students, so maybe we should think about in a, how we can engage more students to join this meeting, so maybe we, we find a way to make a special, uh, special um, framework to activate students to participate. Yeah, and what I personally liked a lot that there, when I compare this with German conferences on uh, on this subject, there are very low amount of women giving presentations. So this time it was very different. Uh, I think there were more women than men giving presentations. So I enjoyed it a lot. Good. This was my very personal point of view. This was my very personal, uh, independent if it's politically correct or not. This is just uh, my point of view. <laughs> Here is politically correct. That is all <laughs> yeah, I think this is my general okay. impression. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the conference. energy-related catalysts. This is a combination of two titles that I had suggested, and there was no clear response when I should do, so I said, okay, I do a combination. Um, you are all familiar with who I am and that I have two affiliations. Um, before I go into the scientific details, I would like to thank my group leaders. Uh, some of these group leaders are well known in the audience that you can hear. Uh, they are essentially running the, the group and also all the co-workers and without them it would be impossible for me to present what I have prepared for you. 
I also have to thank a few postdocs that are named here. They have produced uh, special material that is needed in this presentation. And I would like to thank my external collaborators with whom we are connected in this and related activities that are also relevant for the presentation here. And of course, all of them who are sitting here. There are three people outside the room and take care that this, transform, this, this transition works well. Now, what do we do? Um, we all are interested in heterogeneous catalysis, and one of the key issues is not only to know how catalysts function, but in the end you also have to make them. So it is one thing to have a fundamental understanding, and it's another thing to bring this fundamental understanding into a material that can fit in a reactor and produce a product. And the link between these two parts of science is unfortunately not very well uh, developed and established. So catalyst design requires evidence-based knowledge about catalyst function. This is a trivial sentence, but you know in reality it's not that way, because catalyst material science is done by, we say, empirical rules, and then much later scientists come and try to understand how these catalysts function. And the relation backward and forward is very weakly developed, as I say. We know also that performance catalysts undergo multiple structural changes. And the interesting question is, is this essential for their function, or is this simply a nuisance because nothing lives forever? And that is a fundamental challenge that I would like to answer in my presentation. Chemical dynamics is an important word in this context, very well known also in your institute. And that is only made accessible through operando analysis. That is one of the fundamental reasons why it is not only nice to do in situ and operando analysis, it is essential and critical to do that. Nanostructuring is an important ingredient in this because nanostructuring control, controls the kinetics of the chemical dynamics that is induced by the the stimulus of the reactants and the temperature and the pressure, so the conditions in which the catalyst functions. I have written in brackets, usually this nanostructuring is seen as a little additive, and people still argue using phase diagrams with what a catalyst could do or not could do, in particular when they think about stability of oxides or melting and such things, and we know who are practicing in catalysis that the real life of a catalyst is far away from that what you can find in a phase diagram. And the phase diagram is a lower limit of something, but it is definitely not a good descriptor of what a catalyst does when it, when it functions. And the catalyst design needs to explicitly address such responses and of course, over the years, scientists have developed tools for doing that. One of these tools is chemical potential gradients through interfaces. That means you don't just have exposed a surface, but you expose the surface that is connected with interfaces to the gas phase you call the names of that is strong metal support interaction, for example, is a phenomenon like this. Or in electrochemistry, that you have protective layers or you have nanoparticle segregation on the support, there are multiple realizations of this. As I said, active phase support interaction is not necessarily only strong. There are also weaker support interactions when you think about hydrogen bridges or the support directs polar molecules in the direction of the, of, of the catalytic active site, or there is molecular traffic control, all these beautiful terms that you have in the literature, and some of them sound very, uh, very interesting, but there is, of course, always a truth to that. A catalyst or a catalytically active site can never be considered simply being alone in vacuum. That is always wrong. You might understand that I have a critical view on the new term of single atom catalysis, because a single atom that you put in vacuum does not do any catalytic reaction whatsoever. And then, of course, one has to think about the activation of a material. This is what I call chemical energy within the active phase. One sees there very clearly there is a real structure, there is defects, there is phenomena like milling, pressing, sieving, all these mesoscopic phenomena that you do after 
you had synthesized uh, Arctic phase, they are also important because they provide an, a reservoir for chemical energy that is needed in order to overcome the activation barriers for dynamic operation. Because dynamic operation has also something to do with nucleation and growth, and of course there are, these are activated processes that need to overcome some barriers. Now, when we put this in a diagram, what I have said that I would like to use this, this little star here. What you see is, it is not enough to make a parent bulk structure of the catalytic material. You come up with theory that says you should use platinum, gold, or palladium, gold, copper, God knows what, of a certain composition, and then you synthesize it, but that is usually not the catalyst. Then you have to learn a structure, and if you don't do it, then the catalyst does it itself. Think about thin films or foils, and if you put them under operation conditions, they usually change their mesoscopic structure. And that happens by ligation, so they need to absorb something from the environment, then they become activated. A good example for that is you dissolve hydrogen or oxygen in a metal, or you reduce an oxide to an oxide in a lower oxidation state. Then this is then the active form that absorbs across the reactions. Then you get a reaction. Then the adaptation is necessary because in most reactions that we are interested in, we have not only one reaction that the catalyst does, but several. Think about you first dissociate the diatomic molecule and you take the atoms and bring them on some support, like in selective oxidation, and then you need a consecutive reaction that also needs ligation and absorption, then you get a reaction to product, and then you, if you're happy, then you desorb the product and you go into the catalytic cycle. And you see all these errors that go back to the initial material because no one has said that the probability 100% that all of these reactions occur only in the pathway how we want it to be. We see that, of course, the material does what it does and it wants to minimize its energy. And, of course, the energy minimum is always go back to the initial state because that is lower in energy than the material that is a catalytic active material. It is called a high energy state. So it has the tendency to go back. That means we have to find a way to prevent this going back we want that the forward reaction to activate is as quick as possible and the backward reaction of relaxation is as slow as possible. That is the design job of a catalyst manufacturer. And that happens the same way in the lab as it also happens in industry when you make a large amount of the necessary material. So, what kind of interactions between catalyst and reactants do we have? Reactions usually need strong interactions with the catalyst to allow bond rearrangement. Think about dissociation of oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. You have to overcome huge barriers in order to break these molecules apart. That means weak interactions will not be sufficient. You know this very well from the concept of the Sabatier volcano and all these uh, related say, concepts. The concept of an interaction less catalyst is thus incorrect. So the idea that the catalyst is only there and by virtue of certain forces it, uh, it achieves its reaction and is not being touched by the reactant is probably, this is a nice uh, concept that has been put forward by many people but it is definitely not working. Catalysts rather somehow can regenerate the active sites and that is the miraculous part of a catalyst because we have said the active side is higher energy than the material where it comes from, and that means the regeneration of a catalyst is usually thermodynamically uphill. You have to ask the question, what about second law of thermodynamics? There has to be something in compensation for. As I said, this is a kind of a catalytic material, and here is one of the issues why a catalyst cannot be considered without a reactor, because this regeneration of the active side will not happen in vacuum at low temperature. They usually do not get this. What you see when you do this kind of model experiments, you only get the part of reactions that are downhill, and there is not a good probability that you get something uphill again, and you can then regenerate the full functionality of a catalytic reactions. As I say, none of these processes follow thermodynamic boundary conditions. That is poor for the theorists in the audience, because theorists have a significant issue when they want to calculate the model processes that are not close to thermodynamic equilibrium, because then 
Finding the electric minimum is of course not so simple. One concept that we want to put forward and that is, so to speak, the basis of what I'm going to present to you in the rest of the lecture is that fluctuations are such processes that can regenerate sites without matching. Imagine you would have a solid that has a kind of almost or truly liquid interface, then of course you have fluctuations of local structure as we know them from normal liquids. And then of course the question of what is a high energy material becomes a question of time and space because these fluctuations go between the high and low energy states and that is the reason why there are fluctuations and in this way the regeneration of a catalyst could be a problem without magic. The conceptual disadvantage of this idea is, however, that a catalyst has not a fixed number of active sites, and the active sites are not made when you synthesize the catalyst, but the active sites are only coming when you bring the catalyst in this fluctuating state. That means they would not exist outside the operation. And that's another good reason why it is a clever idea to study a catalyst under working condition, because it might well be that if you do this in vacuum at room temperature, then of course everything is nice and static. And you will see this also later in my presentation. When we use, for example, electron microscopy, then we have to ask very clearly the question, is this the real active state that we see, or is this the frozen image of something that would be dynamically active once you put it under pressure and say two or three hundred degrees centigrade? Now, this the chemical dynamics that is responsible for these kind of fluctuations can be discriminated in two forms. One has chemical dynamics that is introduced by forcing, and that means you have to have a gradient in temperature or pressure, or in chemical potential more general. That is usually the case in a flowing reactor, because in a flowing reactor you have gradients of everything that controls the local chemical potential. Or you have a truly fluctuating situation, in which you are in the, in the state of a so-called thrust rapid phase transition, and then what you do is you exchange the degrees between the surface and the ball, and surface and the ball, with the surface and the gas phase. So adsorption, desorption, equilibrium, for example, would be such a situation. I show you two examples for that. The first one is seen here. This is forcing. This is a platinum single crystal with one in one 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 orientation with nine steps. And this black stuff, black stuff that you find is the carbon impurities. So usually you don't talk about this. This happens when you clean a crystal. And when you watch now with a high pressure microscope what's happening, then you see all kinds of processes that happen at the surface, but they are in the end lead to a cleaned catalytic surface. But you also see quite nicely that there is a significant influence on the local structure evolution of the surface with this cleaning process. The opposite thing of a fluctuating system is shown here. This is a copper catalyst that does methanol oxidation to formaldehyde. And you can quite clearly see that the small particles execute a lot of dynamics. The larger particles are thicker and a bit more lazy, but some of them become also activated during the reaction. So they change their shape and their position. And you see, of course, all the phenomena that are related with the phenomenon of Oswald ripening and catalyst particles grow and they fall apart with each other. So this is a truly fluctuating circuit. Now, that was the introduction to what I wanted to say, and now I go into the more practical part of it. Um, the practical part, as I say, concerns energy-related catalysts, because in this slide you will see that the problem of dealing with energy issues is not necessarily a problem of our times. Alexander von Humboldt, who you might maybe know as a scientist, wrote in his book in the year 1800, Mankind has the, the power and the ability to modify the environment and destroy it, and the consequences of destroying the environment might be catastrophic. That was a very good statement in the year 1800, because at that time this was pre-industrial revolution, there was no carbon burning, all this was not yet existing. And yet he could already observe the phenomena that happen when mankind interacts with the environment in a non-careful uh, non situation. So this is not a problem of our times. Now we go to a few slides to give you an impression of what the challenge of changing our energy system that we have today really is. The EU has decided we want to reduce our CO2 emissions according to this Paris Agreement. 
And the only part of the energy system that is left with the, with the allowance to emit also in future CO2 is mobility, because cars, you cannot really collect the CO2. So you have to think about what do you do with driving when you cannot, when you cannot collect this, this anymore, this, uh, this CO2. Um, here I show in the diagram how we actually are expected to change our policies. The red line that is, is what the EU does at the moment and what projection would happen when we do this until the year 2050. And then you see we miserably failed the 80% target that was given. And that is the reason why at the moment in Europe there is a huge activity in finding additional political uh, views in order to, to come up with new measures that are really massively different from what we have now, because otherwise we will not reach these targets. You also see that they have the planning that electricity generation creates zero CO2, the same as with house heating, there's a little bit left for industry, as I said, there is something left for mobility, and people think they cannot get rid of the CO2 emission from agriculture and from certain other small sources. So that means essentially it's heating and electricity generation that has to carry the load. Mobility in Europe is the fifth largest CO2 emitter. It's bad situation, as you see this also in this green part of the diagram, that it has not contributed to any CO2 reduction, also we have put in place many regulations that limits the CO2 emission per kilometer, but that didn't impress. And I leave this to you whether this is, is a bad lawyer, or this is simply because people drive more kilometers than they used to drive. And this is a problem that's being debated heavily in the, uh, at the, in the present political situation in Europe. I give you some numbers here that you see this. These are thousands of millions of tons of CO2. So imagine this is enormously large. And if you now want to do something with chemistry, then at least you have to do something with several hundreds of millions of tons per year. And that means very clearly it is not enough to have one or two plants in Europe, but you need thousands of plants, or more than thousand plants in Europe to, to change part of the CO2 emission. And this also tells you that we are better off with the technologies that we have today, because if we want to create thousand chemical plants in the next 20 years, it is not very likely that there will be a technology used that does not exist even yet. So we have to see very clearly what the challenge here is. So why do we need chemistry at all? And why don't we say we do everything with solar and wind fields? Why is this not good enough? That simply comes from the fact that the energy needs that we have is way too large to do this locally. Energy imports, and EU imports most of its energy today, and I dare to say this will also happen in the future, because the possibilities within Europe to generate renewable energy in the amounts that we need is very clearly not given. This is not possible. And then there's another big challenge in this point, that is that the renewable energy needs to be stored to about 50% of its consumption, 50% you can do directly, but when you store renewable energy into some energy carriers and you burn them in the end again, then you lose 80% of the primary energy. That means for any stored amount of primary energy, you need four times the amount to generate first in order to be able to to have this energy available when you want it and not when there is sun and, and the sun and wind present. In the political circles, this is usually compensated by saying we will just create a much more effi efficient energy system and this, this efficiency gain that we have will compensate for the storage gap. That is also quantitatively not feasible that ever will happen. I will show you the numbers in a moment. That is, we have to think about the idea that renewable energy is a global commodity and will be transported by ships and pipelines the same way as uh, non-renewable or fossil energy is being transported today. The whole thing is we have to replace black oil and black gas by green oil and green gas. That is the essential concept. You might not think that this is really realistic, but I will hopefully convince you that this is a realistic and be necessary. 
A few numbers here. This is the energy consumption of the EU in very large numbers. This is megatons oil equivalent. And a megaton oil equivalent is a very, very large number of, of energy. And one can see how much of the energy is at the moment generated in the EU. It's 311. And what we import is 903. And of course, you have also to add the nuclear energy that exists in, in Europe, not in Germany anymore, and that is also a significant fraction. What we have dealt in Europe with is renewable energy generation that produces 211 uh, megaton oil equivalent. So you can say all the renewable energy resources in Europe are at the moment equivalent to all nuclear power stations. That is about the same situation. And the nuclear power stations contribute only order of magnitude of 15% to the total energy bill. So that means we need a lot more renewable energy to be generated in Europe. I have given you the number, it's 1,214 megaton oil equivalents. If we want to achieve this by the year 2050, then we would have to put up installations that create every year 40 megaton oil equivalents in addition, every year in addition. And what we do at the moment is 10% of this. That you can see quite nicely from this diagram, that is the growth of renewable energy in Europe, and that is the extrapolation, what we can do until the year 2050, and even that would not be enough to satisfy the energy demands of Europe today. And then we have not talked about that we might need more energy in 30 years than we do now. That is, of course, completely excluded. Take-home message here is we need a very large number of additional renewable energy that needs to be imported from areas outside of Europe. For example, from your part of the world. That is, would be very useful. At the moment, you deliver a lot of this non-renewable energy to Europe, and we will see how we, have, we can replace that. So, how do we do this? If we can do very simple, very fast, because that's easy. What we have to do is we have to create a carbon cycle that functions the same way as biology does it. You have the low energy part of the carbon cycle, that is CO2, then you have to collect it, isolate it, and clean it. And then you have to charge it, and then you create a fuel, and the fuel can be stored and transported, and then you can burn it in the end and create the end energy that you want. And the charging of the CO2 is nothing else, chemically speaking, than reacting CO2 with hydrogen. And if you want to do a reaction of CO2 with hydrogen, then you have to have large amounts of hydrogen, and the only way how you can do this is you can take renewable electricity and split water and get hydrogen and oxygen. The photochemical approach to that has already, it's always said would be an alternative, but has already been qualified as being certainly nothing that would come us to help in the next 50 years, at least not in the dimensions that we are talking about. We are, as I say, not interested in small scale, decentralized, personalized uh, phenomena where this might play a role. We are really interested in big ships and pipeline full of hydrogen, and that will, will not come from photochemical processes, certainly not in the next 50 years. So we have to live with electrolysis and CO2 hydrogenation. And this is, by and large, a heterogeneous analytic process. So it is a good idea to understand what do we have as technologies today available, and what can we really bring out in the necessary dimensions. This system is very wasteful in energy. It loses, as I say, about 80% of its renewable energy input, but it's the only way in order to store large amounts of ele electricity or primary energy, and it allows you sector coupling because a significant part of the energy system simply cannot be made electric. Think about the chemical industry, think about airplanes, think about heavy lorries in, in, in lonely areas where you have simply not the possibility to do this electrically. Okay, what can we do in practice? We have to think about how we do CO2 hydrogenation, and people would say, oh, CO2 is a very uh, non-reactive molecule, it is difficult. I will convince you, no, it's not true. CO2 is not a non-reactive molecule. The problem is not activating CO2, but the problem is then to react with the activated CO2 molecule with something that is useful as a fuel. So the second step that comes after activation is the problem. So how do we do this? We start from hydrogen because the real issue is not CO2 activation, but having enough hydrogen. And we can bind hydrogen either to nitrogen or to CO2. These are the only molecules that we have available in the necessary dimensions. 
Japanese and other researchers think that you can also use organic molecules and do this with organic synthesis. Um, I'm not so convinced that this is an important contributor, but I am not got further. So be it also a liquid organic hydrogen hydrocarbon carrier, so it's fine with me. And then we end up either with ammonia, and ammonia we can make better transportable to convert it to urea, because urea is very easy to transport, that's no problem. Or you can, we can convert it to ammonium nitrate, and can use ammonium nitrate is, for example, a fuel for turbines, this is a doable thing. The nitrogen part has the huge advantage that we do not have to recollect the carrier molecule, because it's in the atmosphere in sufficient quantity that we do not have to close the loop. The very dangerous disadvantage of the nitrogen route is that there are selectivity problems because the most important byproduct that you get from all of this is Lachta, so N2O. And N2O is a climate relevant gas with 700 fold the same power as CO2. So you have to be very careful when you do that. And if you do not have a good N2O decomposition catalysis process, then we run into problems. And in your institute, you have worked on this earlier, and you know by yourself that this is a not simple process to remove N2O completely out of a gas stream. So it might be a good idea to stay with the current sources, and then you have possibilities like phobic acids, methanol, you can make synthesis gas, and this leads you to a, a group of molecules, C1 oligomers, oxymethylene, ethers, dimethyl carbonate, for example, higher alkanes, conventional uh, alkanes that you use now as fuels, methane, of course, not so synthetic natural gas, a very strange word to me, but that is how people talk about it, or higher alcohols. And the processes are fischer drop synthesis and methanol synthesis and, and uh, zeolite-mediated methanol condensation processes. All of these things exist in large scale. We have all developed them to a way that we can build uh, world-scale plants with this. The problem is to get this all fixed together. Now, what we do in these processes, I have indicated here fundamentally, you activate first CO2 and make carboxylate. This is CO2 with a negative charge. Then you have a, a bent molecule, and this bent molecule can undergo five different classes of reactions. The simplest one, it can dimerize and form oxalate, and you can react and oxalate further. You can undergo a redox. Uh, reaction, they came home CO and carbonate. That also happens when you compose oxalate, that then you can make a cycle between the two. Then, of course, you can do acid base reaction, then you make carbonates. This is mineralization, and that is by the, by the way the largest of all of the reactions on this planet. You think about all the different mountains on this planet that are made out of calcium carbonate, they are made by this reaction. Then, of course, there's proton electron transfer, then you end up with formate in different forms. So, this is the reduction part, and this is what we will discuss in the future, in the next part of the lecture. This is chemical reduction with hydrogen. Or you don't have to react it with hydrogen. You can, of course, react with any high energy molecule. For example, you can use an epoxide and react it there and get it to polymers. These are the possibilities that one has. So, when we put this more into a chemical language, then we see what we do first, as I say, is we make usually formate. This is already a catalytic process. We can make formic acid out of this, that is easy. And then depending on whether you use an oxophilic or a carbophilic catalyst, you either come to CO and fischer tropsch catalysis, or you come to mesoxy and methanol, and then the condensation chemistry that you can do with methanol and its oxidation product from aldehyde. That is indicated with this red little egg. And the molecules that I have indicated are simply target molecules, and all of these number target molecules are energy vectors. You can use them all together. And I am personally a strong supporter that we should look into the possibilities of all of these molecules rather than decide today that for a certain reason we only go for any one of these solutions. I'm sure that on the planet there is a good opportunity to use all of these molecules together. So it is a nice idea to study this blue box that you see, where the simple reactions occur that decide over what happens to the activated CO2 molecule. I will use now for the rest of my presentation the case of methanol synthesis. Not that it would not be interested also to look into the fischer dropsch chemistry, but I have a personal 
uh, record in methanol synthesis research, so I used this simply in order to, to make this more tangible for you. And I also have to say the fischer tropsch chemistry has been reviewed many, many times, and we have a very good understanding what we do not understand in fischer tropsch chemistry. fischer tropsch chemistry is still a very difficult thing uh, to do also. It looks very attractive from the first place, but as you all know, when you do it in practice, this is not so simple. So, methanol is a convenient energy storage reactor, it's fine. It has, a, unfortunately, a few challenges. The most important one from a catalytic point of view that this is product inhibited. So, methoxy is its own poison to the active site, and that is a significant limit that, that you have when you do the thing under performance conditions. The energy vector is indicated here, so really you have this the cycle between CO2 and methanol and that transports essentially hydrogen around because hydrogen transporting by itself is not such an easy thing as you know. The energy density of methanol is okay, it's not perfect, it's about half of the energy density that it gets from a liquid hydrocarbon, but it is suitable because you can use it as a vector and you can convert methanol to many follow-up products as I have shown in the previous slide. You also know the thermodynamics and if not, then I have outlined it here. The, the important thing to notice is that makes also the, the, the only real challenge in this kind of chemistry is that this is an um, equilibrium-based reaction that has three molecules in it, CO2, CO, and methanol. And all three form an equilibrium, and that means it is, under circumstances, not so easy to control the selectivity such that you're easier to reverse or like a shift reaction or methanol synthesis. You cannot escape this problem. And that is, I want to make this very clear here, there is a lot of modern literature where people claim that they, they, they devise catalysts that have a better selectivity to methanol than they have for uh, carbon monoxide. But then you only will find when you read these papers that are works in the limit of very low conversions because then you are so far away from equilibrium that you are not bothered, bothered with, the, with the equilibrium formation of the reverse order gas shift reaction. But when you want to run a catalyst on the high productivity of methanol, then you inevitably have the problem of reverse order gas shift. And how large that problem is, I will show in a few slides in, in a moment. Okay, the equilibrium limitation is severe. As you can see here, the red line that you indicate is the CO2 equilibrium at 50 bar pressure, and the catalysts that we have operate in a temperature window between 470 and 550 Kelvin. So we get an equilibrium conversion of roughly 20%. That's all what you can have, equilibrium. And this means that this idea of a methanol economy that you might have heard from Mr. Ola has of course also this limit. That means you have to build plants that have an enormous recycling part in it, and the, the design of the engineering of methanol synthesis has to take care about this problem of recycling because this is huge amounts of gas that you have to travel around at 50 bar pressure. Nevertheless, that exists. This is an industrial version of a catalyst. Um, our department was severely involved in the recipe formation of making this catalyst. This is a pretty good state-of-the-art material that produces at 50 bar pressure uh, as a benchmark information about 1.5 kilograms of methanol per kilogram catalyst an hour. So this is the, the ballpark in which that works. And that falls down when you go to lower pressures at 30 bar, where people would like to run the water splitting reaction to about one uh, kilogram of methanol per kilogram catalyst an hour. That is the productivity. And then you understand, under these conditions, you are really equilibrium limited. Now, I show you first a Pathfinder project. We, we try to do this in big, not only on paper. There's a project called Carbon to Chem that uses a steel mill and has a pretty large, a pretty large project that tries to convert 250,000 tons of CO2 per year. Uh, so this is a very minute number when you remember that I've told you a thousand millions of tons in Europe per year but 250,000 tons per year is not a laboratory experiment. This is a full-fledged, world-scale plant that we need for that. And that is at the moment being, being designed. I show you how far we are. The, the design of the concept is the following. We take these off-gases from the steel, we purify them, convert them into gas creams of nitrogen, CO2, and synthesis gas. And then we have our catalytic reactors that take hydrogen for water splitting and produce this range of molecules that I have indicated in the colored in the colored boxes at the bottom of the diagram. 
You can ask the question, why is sugar producing more than one molecule simply? When you look at the, the, the value, the market value of these molecules, they are very different. And we have to find an economic way of doing this, and that means that we might also produce molecules that are very valuable, but they will not save the CO2, and they create extra money that we can use in order to, to support the production of large-scale molecules that save the CO2, but they are not valuable enough that they would pay off for the plant that we have. So this is a, the economic optimization of this process is not trivial. And this is not supported by any state subsidy. This plant will operate on the expenses that they generate from selling the products. Of our army, this is our test water splitting system that is not large, but this is not small. It's about 3.5 megawatts. And in this system, we test reactions of the electrocatalysts that we use that operate under dynamic load conditions. That means this is only switched on when there is renewable electricity available, because to make hydrogen from electricity that comes from coal burning is, of course, useless for our application. That's our gas separation unit that also has already reached a certain size. In here, we practice in particular to remove the trace impurities that are very toxic for downsize um, catalytic applications. And I give you just one of the challenges that we have is the, the detection of these impurity gases. You would not expect necessarily that out of a steam mill you get 80 ppb of acryl nitrile as a, as a toxic gas that comes from this gas purifier, but in an hour it forms a monolayer of, uh, of condensed, condensed polyacryl nitrile on a copper surface and the catalyst is simply dead. So these are the things that we have to study very extensively in order to solve this. And this is already an analytical challenge in its own right. We have more than 500 molecules that come in trace amounts of below 1 ppm out of this machine. So hmm, this is still an issue. Nevertheless, we have a good performance. You see here two important issues. If you want to modify the methanol synthesis between CO and CO2 as an as a input gas, you have to be careful because a copper zinc oxide catalyst that we use in this, in this uh, operation can only deal with CO2 containing gases. If you operate it only under CO with standard synthesis gas, this catalyst is immediately poisoned and then it recovers only after a very long time. And we studied this extensively. How does this work? This, it is interesting, it's still copper in both cases, and it's written in the literature that copper is the active phase for CO2 hydrogenation as well as for CO hydrogenation. So, why is there this strong poisoning? When you have copper on magnesium oxide, it is impossible to work with CO2, even with traces. If you have copper on zinc oxide, you must be careful to have more than 10% of CO2 in it because otherwise the catalyst also dies. Operandi spectroscopy is the tool to answer this question, and the interesting finding is that indeed, under working conditions, the catalyst surface is partly oxidized. And if you are one of the old literature readers in this area, then you might remember an important researcher in this area was Kamil Clear in, from America, and he published all of his live publications where he said the active state of the, the catalyst is copper one. And nobody believed it because when you do extra diffraction, you find it's a copper metal. And it is bulk copper metal, but the surface is oxidized, at least partly. It's a mixture between copper one oxide and copper metal that is active. And if you have too much CO2 and don't zinc oxide on the surface, it all converts even in copper one two oxide. So CO is the poison that you get here. That's one of the interesting things how we do operando spectroscopy that was not done at high pressure, but it was done at almost atmospheric pressure. I have to mention, if you do this at 0.1 millibar pressure, and how many people work, then you only see the oxidized surface. So the chemical potential of hydrogen is here critically, there's a pressure gap that lies in the area of the order of more than 10 millibar of pressure, and if you're below this pressure, you can't see this partial reduction. Now, how do you synthesize the catalyst? I go very briefly through that. You make a precursor that is zinc and georgiite, then you let this age and you generate zinc and malachite. This means you get a spherical particle that converts into a needle shaped particle. This is nanostructure and at its best. And then you oxidize this thing into an oxide mixture. And then you reduce in such a way that the zinc oxide stays as a mineral spacer. And the, the black copper oxide particles get reduced in the red copper metal particles. If you want to design such a process, it is very difficult to do this. And of course, no one designed this process that was found by serendipity. All of this. 
But of course, by knowing what we do, we were able to optimize this, and the optimization makes the company with which we collaborate making a country that is now about 2.5 times more active than it was 20 years ago. And that comes simply from optimizing these operation steps. The chemical composition is still the same as it was in the year 2000. But the way how you make it is not the same anymore. Where's the problem? The problem lies, of course, in the fact that you have to get exactly the right relative size of the two particles. It's very easily understandable if you get this wrong, that either you have two small synchroxide and two large copper particles, or you have the other way around, and then you get a phase separation, and it's only a good catalyst if the synchroxide particles and the copper particles have exactly the same size. Uh, that's not so easy if you think that a typical synthesis of such a catalyst is 25 tons. So you have a problem, you cannot use any auxiliary reagents and no templating molecules, and so that's all excluded because otherwise that would not be economical anymore. So, um, how do we generate this catalyst? Again, this is useful to do this in operandal spectroscopy. And what I show you here is that this reduction of the material is, is happening in two stages. And that is the reason why you generate not brass as a product of this. You would think copper oxide and zinc oxide reduced with hydrogen gives you brass in water. And of course, unfortunately, this is also the case. When you do this in the lab, under normal conditions, you get this. If you do this correctly, then you see that you can find lower temperatures at 150 degrees where you reduce the copper, but the zinc oxide is not converted, it's still zinc carbonate, and you have to go to higher temperatures of 250 degrees to convert the zinc carbonate to copper, and the fact that the zinc carbonate is so stable prevents the zinc from being reduced to brass. So that's the chemistry that is behind this, and the rest of it is not so important that is on that slide. The, the critical issue is that you see that zinc carbonate is involved with the catalyst synthesis. And then you think now, you take the zinc oxide and charge it with CO2, what will happen under reaction conditions? Of course, the zinc carbonate will form again. That means the interplay between zinc carbonate and zinc oxide that you see in this diagram number B is also a descriptor for the function of this catalyst. And it, you begin immediately to understand why this is the zinc oxide is a co-catalyst in this system because it prevents the copper from being oxidized from the water, and it uh, takes this, the, the CO2 and forms first a carbonate intermediate that can be easier, more easily reduced than uh, the CO2 by itself. That would probably not stick on the surface. So that's a lot of things that we learned from this. Now, how does this look in, in, in nature? Here's an electron micrograph that you see of an activated catalyst. The, the, the red atoms are the copper atoms, the yellow atoms are the zinc oxide. The zinc oxide forms a very strange high level, high energy intermediate. This is graphitic zinc oxide. You see the parallel plates. And then you see two other things that are interesting here. The first thing is that this small nanoparticle, that is about three nanometers in diameter, has lots of lattice defects. This is far away from being a single crystal. And you ask yourself, how can this be active if it is completely encapsulated by zinc oxide? There are two possibilities. Either the CO2 migrates through pores of the zinc oxide that we cannot see, or the zinc oxide is not covering the particle as a whole under operation conditions. It is dynamical. And what we see here is the frozen state of the system. The first indication that this might be true is if you look at the stability of the thing, if you are not very careful with your electron micro mi microscope, then you destroy this zinc oxide overlayer and you form this coexistence of crystals, but that is a beam artifact that is not the true state of the catalyst. For the electron microscopists in the audience, the time that you have in order for exposure to get this, this big picture with the yellow stuff on this point, three seconds at 300 keV and about a, a tenth of a pico ampere of current. So very low dose conditions that you can see this. Now when you look at the second information why this could be dynamic, it comes from the, from the deactivation studies. We do now an identical location TM experiment of one copper particle that we study fresh, and then we study the very same particle after a half a year of operation under 50 bar pressure, and then it looks the same very same particle looks like this. What you see, what has happened is that the copper is now much better ordered. This is now almost a single crystal. You see the very nice faceting terminating areas. And the zinc oxide was from this disordered uh, overlayer state, you really changed it to a zinc oxide crystal. 
And that is an indication, that's an inactive particle. So we would say that this cannot be penetrated by any gas and that you can easily measure due to hydrogen surface area determination and you see how the surface area of the, of the available copper is strongly uh, degraded after half a year of operation. What you also can make is you can synthesize catalysts that do not show this mod mode of deactivation, that show as a mode of deactivation sintering, so the, the copper particles grow larger, and when you look in, at the electron microscopy of this, then you see that this is a different structure, because here the copper and the zinc particles interact in such a way that there is no strong metal support interaction between zinc oxide and copper, there is rather a perimeter of zinc oxide on a large copper particle. Um, and you can also see here in this 3D electron microcraft, you see very nice the zinc oxide support, and you see this copper particle sitting on top of it, and they form a very porous structure, and this porous structure is where the CO2 and the hydrogen is diffusing through. This is really a super high performance catalyst, and you can make it at 25 tons, and the one ton costs about 1,500 euros. So, this is a very nice um, artwork of nanotechnology. What's the surface composition of the system? The surface composition, you would think, is of course 70% copper, 30% zinc oxide. It is copper. That's not true. We can very clearly see when we do this again in operation conditions. This is at 1 millibar, no, it's only 2.5 millibar. You see the whole thing is fully covered by zinc oxide and the promoter aluminium, and there's only a very small fraction of copper that is available. You can integrate this over the information depths of full emission and then you learn uh, at the outer surface you'll see that about 50% of the available surface is zinc oxide and the other 50% uh, is copper. This is far away from the 70-30 that we would have expected, but it is also not 100 than zero. That means the TM image is apparently not reflecting this because what you saw in the TM was about 2 nanometer thick and the 2 nanometer thickness, the surface analysis tells you about the one existence of copper and zinc oxide. So that's not true. I skip this. I do the next one is now high pressure dynamical operation. You have the first indication that the zinc oxide and copper system is dynamical with each other under operation conditions. And the question is, do we see this also in high pressure performance? And the answer is yes, because this is a reaction that you can squeeze with reaction parameters however you like them, and the performance is always the same. You see here a performance experiment at 35 bar pressure over 2,250 hours, and wherever there was one of these errors that we have introduced, 50 times a change in the chemical potential of hydrogen of 100%, and this for 15 minutes backward and forward. You see any one of these pulses found here, uh, indicated here. And the effect on the deactivation is exactly zero. So this does not deactivate also. This is a very unusual way how you operate a catalyst. You can also do this with temperature variation, you can change the flow rate variation, you can do a, a, a long-term hydrogen variation, whatever you want, and the performance stays completely constant. That is a very good indirect indication that this is really a dynamic state and the catalyst really adjusts itself in the relation between zinc oxide and copper to whatever the chemical potential in the gas phase in the other environment is. Now, is copper capable of having such a dynamics? Because you can ask the question if the zinc oxide is sitting on top of it, by the hell should this ever move away? And the only answer is there must be a problem with the interface between copper and zinc oxide and copper itself must have the capability when the chemical potential is changing to, in, in inverted commas, liquefy its own surface. And that is indicated here. This is a copper polycrystal with different crystal facets. And you see three different states of copper there. Iron, that you see on the top right hand side, is copper oxide. The faceted surface, that is the main area, is, is pure copper, and the smooth area is pure copper that is covered with oxygen, so oxygen adsorbed on copper. So oxygen adsorption lifts the facility. And now we put this into a, a temporal evolution under reaction conditions that are typically for methanol synthesis, and I, you see a clock, and then you can observe what the surface does. So it is truly dynamic, and you see that the interface is completely changing backward and forward, and this reaction is driven by an oscillatory process between copper oxide and copper plus oxygen. 
And that explains, of course, why the sink oxide can never be fixed on the surface because if the surface itself is moving that way, then the sink oxide will, be, of course, always be shaking around. Now, the, the question is how does we know that there are three stages here and how did we analyze which is which? This is done by an electron microscopic technique. We freeze in any one of these states and then we put them in a machine which allows us to do target preparation. So we cut out a little lamella of the material, put it in a TM, rotate it by 90 degrees, and study the phase composition. And then we can do with all kinds of different things. We can also do energy loss spectroscopy in order to determine the ratio between copper metal and residual oxygen that is in there, that is indicated here. And here I show you one of the interfaces that we have generated. And one can do all electron crystallography so we know exactly which, which part of the surface is which. So I think we have a very good understanding of what is happening when you have this dynamical situation. And this dynamical situation here was mimicked by hydrogen plus oxygen, but we adjusted the chemical potential such that it is the same as you would have used methanol synthesis. We did not use the methanol synthesis reaction conditions because we wanted to avoid the contamination that we get when there's methanol adsorbent that creates a lot of additional difficulties when you do the material analysis. Back to, to chemistry. Um, I'm almost done with my presentation, but I want to give you at least a little bit of a view of what we can learn about this question. Is there uh, an equilibrium between um, methanol synthesis and CO synthesis in such a way that this is given by Godfather, or is this really, can this be influenced by changing the catalyst? When you do the activation energy uh, determination, then you see already methanol and for CO, they are very different, that's fine. You see here a selectivity plot as a function of temperature. This is also common. Um, there are people in the audience who know this selectivity plot quite well. They have determined it, and part of it, we do this now routinely. And what you also see here is what I plotted is the normalized yield of CO in equilibrium and the normalized yield that we get experimentally, and if that would be in equilibrium, we would see a straight line, and you can see it's not a straight line, that means also we run the methanol synthesis under full equilibrium conditions, the CO synthesis is not under full equilibrium, that means there is a kinetic barrier for reaching the reverse water gas shift uh, equilibrium, and this kinetic barrier is to our advantage, and then of course the consequence of that is, this allows us to speculate that there might be catalysts in the world that have the possibility that for kinetic reasons we can reach one equilibrium under the same conditions faster than the other equilibrium. If that would be the case, that would be a perfect catalyst that we would love to find it. And that is, of course, one of the key issues for this additional for future research in methanol synthesis would have to concentrate on this part. I skip now for time reasons this part and go a bit, little bit to the question, the final thing is what is now really the active state? You have seen this copper oscillates between an oxidized and a non-oxidized form and the, reason, the question is how can this oscillation occur in the presence of 50 bar of hydrogen? That is enormous, so you would think that all oxygen is immediately disappearing. That is not the case. We measure the oxygen diffusivity in copper here with the N2O method and then we identify by hydrogen spectroscopy indeed or that also this material is by and large copper, there's a little bit of oxygen in there. You first see that the role of oxygen is that the diffusivity of oxygen in copper is strongly reduced under these conditions, and that is important because you know that or hopefully you know that the reaction mechanism of copper oxide reduction happens that the copper atoms have to move. But if the copper atoms are fixed because there is like sand grains. In a, in, in a motor, there are oxygen atoms in between, then the mobility of the copper atoms is greatly reduced by two and a half orders of magnitude. And when you study this by spectroscopy, you find also that there is an indication, yes, this is not exactly pure copper, there's a little bit of extra intensity in the nexus area, and when you do now a proper normalization, then you also find that this is not in the, in the transition between copper and oxygen in the deep end, so there's no PD transition, but where you find this is in the P in the DS transition. So this meets at 940 EV somewhere. And that indicates to us that this oxygen is not an oxygen to minus ion, but this is indeed an oxygen atom. And what we see here is a kind of alloy state between oxygen and copper rather than a copper oxide. As nicely indicated, that is the reason why you don't see the white line for copper oxide, 
the copper oxide white line on the spectrum could be three times as big as the, as, as the whole diagram that I show you. So this is not a tiny amount of copper monoxide, but this is a strange state of oxygen in copper. Now the last thing that I want to address, I am now one hour and two minutes. So I, you give me two more minutes, I hope this is okay. Two more slides? Yes. Okay. Then the last issue is, why is this not brass? At 50 bar pressure. And then the question is, now it could be brass. And then we did an experiment for that. This is operando catalysis in an X-ray diffractometer. And then you see, if you keep the reaction temperature above 300 degrees, you see a non isothermal increase of the Nazis constant because you do form brass at 300 degrees. And interestingly enough, you see simultaneously that the Arrhenius parameter also increases. That means Brass is not a poison, brass also can synthesize methanol, but this is not as effective as the combination of zinc oxide with, with lattice defects in it and with, uh, with copper metal that has oxygen in it. That's interesting because you would say this is a semantic difference. Copper plus oxygen and zinc oxide with defects is the so different from brass that has a little bit of oxygen or the, or the surface oxide layer. And the answer is yes, it is different. Here you see another nice TM image where one can indeed see this. This is a copper crystal, and you see the zinc oxide surrounding it, and there where the yellow line is, then you see there's an interpenetration of some of the zinc into the copper, and that forms the brass that you can also see in the diffraction pattern. I don't want to go into that to, to tire you too much, but that what the process that is indicated in this yellow line is the reason why you see a slight expansion of the lattice constant. So this is it's all consistent. So, I skip also this slide for time reasons and go to my conclusions. Um, otherwise, this will never, never end. Oh, sorry, there's a problem. Um, I'm running into an issue here. I was too fast. You excuse me for a moment. I come back in a moment. That's very bad, sorry. What has happened here? I have lost my presentation, das ist sehr schlecht. I go here. Last slide. So what did you learn from all of that? You can say, Schlügel, you tired me enormously. You have listened now to lots of details and spectroscopic nice findings, but what is the value? Why, why did I show you all this? So what can we learn? First we can learn methanol synthesis from pure CO2 and hydrogen is quite possible. We should take it to catalyst and there's no need for energy applications to develop a new process. It works fine as it is. You can also ask the question, are the operation conditions the best possible ones that we have? And the answer is yes. Because we are limited by the hydrogen source. This is 30 bars for electrochemical reasons. If we go for higher, um, higher pressure, then we go also for higher performance. But the one kilogram methanol per kilogram catalyst an hour is an absolutely competitive performance when you think to the normal zinc gas synthesis that has very much the same, the same productivity. The lower temperature limit that I didn't show you is given by product inhibition. We did show that the lower temperature limit is given by the fact that there's a monolayer of methoxy at the surface and if you go below 200 degrees, this methoxy is simply no longer hydrogenated and it is not dissolving, that means it blocks all the active sites. I did show you that the higher limit is given by the brass formation, but of course you don't want to go to high temperature anyway because the equilibrium is unfavorable for you. So you would like to go to low temperature, but the low temperature is indeed limited by the fact that there is methoxy absorbing and blocking the active sites. And the stability of the whole system is given by the stability of the co catalyst zinc oxide. If the zinc oxide is recrystallizing and cannot dynamically respond to the surface change of the copper anymore because it's a thick crystal, then the catalyst is also dead. So we know now exactly what are the ingredients that allow this thing to operate. The active sites are the location uh, located in the perimeter between the two co-catalysts between oxygen containing copper metal and zinc oxide that has defects. And however you make this perimeter, this depends on your choice. You can have it even that there are little patches of zinc oxide that are moving around, or you can put uh, a combination of zinc oxide crystals in close contact to copper crystals that do not overgrow, but you still have a perimeter that is that, that doesn't matter both ways. It works in both types of catalysts are also existing under industrial conditions. 
I did not show that was the part that I was over, overdoing because I think this is too much for now. We also tested, of course, the electrochemical synthesis of methanol from copper under the CO2 reduction in the electrochemical cell, and of course that also works. It has a different kind of limitation. The limitation there is carbonate formation. That is the analog, what is in the gas phase, the methoxide formation. And there is also a defective copper oxide as the active phase and the recrystallization under electric chemical potential of the defective copper oxide. The perfect copper oxide is the deactivation mechanism of the electrode. So that is rather similar. That means the electrochemical synthesis is limited by the same reaction as the water splitting oxygen evolution reaction. And that is by, in a systemic view, it is no advantage to say we do this in one reaction and we do everything electrochemically because you either get hydrogen and do it with methanol synthesis at high pressure as I showed you and there the limit is the oxygen evolution reaction or you do it also in your electrochemical device and then you are limited in the any productivity by the same problem which is also oxygen evolution reaction. It's just the current that you can draw from the system. So there's no fundamental advantage of the direct synthesis, and you have the disadvantages. You have a complex selectivity issue. It's not only CO that you form as a byproduct, you form also other uh, organic molecules, you form acetylene, you form forming acid, and God knows what. And this all is very diluted in an aqueous solution that you don't really want. And the space time yield at the moment of this electrochemical reduction is extremely poor. It is orders of magnitude lower than what you do in the gas phase. And so it is very preferable when you think about the challenge to do something for the energy system to stick with this combined process of electrochemical water splitting and gas phase methanol synthesis. This is the right uh, way of moving forward. This is working very well. This is a stable operation and this is highly effective. And I think even with lots of research, it will not be possible to make the efficiency of this combination of the process significantly larger than we are now. So we have to live with an energy system that lives also with these efficiencies. What you can improve is the selectivity issue potentially, and what you also can improve is the lifetime of the catalyst, because in a situation where you use the methanol synthesis in order to reduce CO2 emission, you lose twice if the reaction is not working, because you do not form methanol and you pay you use for emitting CO2 that is not being consumed. So I have to be very careful economically. The non-operating of such a plant is extremely, extremely negative. That means lifetime and stability of the operation of a plant that uses CO2 that is otherwise punished by some payment is a very, very important consideration when you think about the realization of such a thing in bay. Now, you have understood this, everything, the last, very last diagram that I want to give you is this one. There is this old statement that in your, in your world is very well known between structure function correlations. And you people usually do this by experimental drawing of linear, linear lines between two observables. There is, of course, the modern world of having complex scriptures that are nonlinear correlations, and you have to trust the computer model for that. There's, of course, the very old fashioned, old school way of thinking the mechanism gives you the structure function correlation. I'm no fan of this because I think a mechanism is a construct of thought, and you cannot verify that a mechanism exists. And this is also the reason why I'm a little bit hesitant to think that theory gives you a structure function correlation. This gives you a plausibility. And the, the real experimental parameter that links structure and function, which I hopefully have shown to you, is this phenomenon of chemical dynamics. Because the structure of the material is unfortunately controlled by the local chemical potential, and the local chemical potential is, of course, given by the function of the catalyst. And this gives a negative feedback loop, and this negative feedback loop couples the red parameters and the blue parameters in such a way that if you do not know this feedback loop, then you will never understand what the structure function relation actually is. That's the end of it. Max Planck said, dem Armen muss das erkennen von ausgehen. Or, what he also said, you better know what you do before you apply it. We all know this is not true. We apply catalysis very happily. And as I hope I could show you in the last hour, we are still very much at the beginning to try to understand all this. Thanks a lot for your kind attention.
my dear Professor Boreskov said that definitely chemical dynamics uh, should govern the chemical reactions, I mean catalytic reactions. Thank you. Thank you again and thank you our internet engineers, I think, to have a really safe... Now you can see me as a person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somebody would like to ask one or two questions. You can do. I see. Yeah. Here, please. Yeah, Robert, thanks for a very inspiring talk. I, I was just wondering about the compatibility of electrolysis, water electrolysis. We both agree that that should be done. Uh, but but how can you make this compatible with the intermittent the intermittency of renewable energy sources? Do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, that is a very critical issue. That is the reason why we have built this large electrolyzer in our project. We simply need to find out how this intermittency really damages the, the systems. So conventional electrolyzers are, are operated without intermittency. This is why they are standing next to, to water hydroelectric installations where everything is safe. And PEM electrolyzers are, have no problems with intermittency, they work fine. But PEM electrolyzers are at the moment we don't know whether they will be ever growing large enough to fulfill the world demand. This is an issue. There is this iridium oxide problem and there is this membrane problem in it. And the alkaline electrolysis might be damaged too much. So at the moment we find this out, how much this damage is. I can tell you we operate this electrolyzer that we see now for a little bit over six months in an intermittent operation and we did not have to change the electrodes yet. But of course, six months is nothing. You would expect six to seven years lifetime, and be looking forward how long that takes. My scientific view is that it is a, it has to be a damage to the system because you understand very well that there are irreversible structural modifications on an electrode as a function of electrochemical potential, and if you change this, these irreversible things will also change, and that usually leads to degradation of the material science. So I would expect yes, there is a massive damage. And this is probably, in the end, when you come to the rollout of water splitting, maybe really the, the showstopper of the whole thing, that it becomes too expensive because the lifetime is not long enough when you do this under inter intermittent conditions. So I believe that this is far away from us, but it is possibly the most dangerous part of the whole operation. We do a lot of research on this, but I have no time to show what we are doing there. Okay. Has a question, so... Not necessary, I think. And uh, thanks again, Robert, to you. <laughs> we continue our uh, seminar with a special procedure. You know that uh, previous year we had the uh, 60th anniversary of the Institute, and we awarded four uh, eminent or prominent scientists uh, with the uh, title of the advanced professor for the Barrestro Institute of Catalysis. And uh, we have no possibility to, to give you the, some, you know, some papers and some uh, labels. But uh, I can do this now and I ask uh, Axel to be a transportation agent just to put this stuff to you. Axel. I'm sure he will volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> Axel, I, please yep. go there. <laughs> In principle... Yeah, very good. Yeah, I, I just read. Boris Institute of Catalysis, Siberian branch of Russian Academy of Sciences, thereby confers upon Robert Schlogan the title Honorary Professor with all honors and distinctions belonging to the title, given at Novosibirsk, Russia on the 20th days of April in the year 2018. But now the award uh, finds a hero, you know. <laughs> Why? Axel, <laughs> just for you. <laughs> <laughs> Also, we have a special uh, sign of this. It's uh, our label, Barrestic Institute of Catalysis. You can see I can it. see, yeah. yeah Very it's well. Institute of Catalysis from the back side. It's also you should transfer. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and some small sign. It's an exact copy of the biggest one. Ah. Just, just put on your suit. Capit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like this. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Thank you so much. I will be a rich. <laughs> Axel? I will take it. Just for Robert. Please transfer. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Now I.
Thank you ever so much for that. And now you deserve to understand why I am not there in person. I did not tell you until now, but I think you should know. Tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, is the General Assembly of the Max Planck Society, and on the agenda is the appointment of, a, of our next Director of Theory. And as I'm the Managing Director of the Institute, I have to defend this appointment. So hopefully tomorrow by that time we have a new director in the institute for our theory department. And I hope you have understanding that this is unfortunately slightly more important than what I did now. I hope for your deep understanding for that. I feel very bad that I cannot be with you in person, but I did not choose this timing. This timing came over me, and that is the reason why I couldn't be with you. I think you should know that. We agree. This is a really strong reason. To be there, not with us. And that's okay. the only reason to justify this. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> and maybe uh, because we are close to closing ceremony, maybe you say something about the next seminar. I know from Axel that you decided and I agreed with the time and uh, the place where the next seminar will be. Maybe yes, I think we should... The, the only thing that I have to say from here is that we should continue, that we are willing to do, very willing to do that, Axel has brought you the suggestions. Um, I understand from you that you would follow our suggestion. Is this correct? It's thank you, time and space. Okay, then we do it that way. We will be happy also to cover the expenses as we did this in the past. Is that also okay for you? Because that we, I need to know because I need to plan for that. Okay, yes. We it's also okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, then this is all fine. And I think I'm, I'm really looking forward that I see you all here. It would be very beneficial if you would think about maybe a kind of topic that we have that we could argue, agree on what, how we bridge the lectures together. Because I've, I was, when I was present in these seminars, I found it always very stimulating that we had a kind of scientific program as we went along. It was not just a, a statistical mixture of issues, but there was also some, some guiding principle behind the program. And if you could agree on any of that, then it would be very useful. Because I think it is more attractive that it is organized in that way. Okay. Otherwise, I welcome you. I welcome you very warmly now to Germany again. As we say, it is very warm today. It's about 35 degrees plus here in Berlin. So I don't know how warm it is in your part. It's also warm there, I guess. But I, work, I welcome you to an extra warm uh, <laughs> next seminar when we come in. I will make sure that it will then be the 40 degree uh, limit. It will be above 40 degrees in Germany. That is to be expected in the near future. We start with the 18 degrees here in Sunday, but now the temperature is growing up. And here now, okay. the 26, 10 degrees less than in Berlin. <laughs> and you should not forget that also this conference also has a very important experimental section. Sure. This is selective oxidation of biomass in aqueous solution. Sure, um, you, you, you must not forget that. We will provide the raw material and you will provide the catalyst. Okay. Hopefully. <laughs> Resolve. Can we leave it to that? Okay. Thank you. Again. Then I welcome you and I thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, for the lecture and uh, hopefully next time in Russian German seminar. You remember that when we go to Russia, we have Russian first, and when we go to the Germany, German Russian seminar we organize. So for the okay. next, I am sure I'm not sure, but I hope that you will be with us in the next Russian-German seminar. In Germany, you okay. will join us. But there will be a lucky defect for that. Yes, I understand. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> not so long time. Okay, yes. thank, you. thank you so much.
So um, we suggest that we will meet at the 12th of June in 2022. I just learned that it is a, a, a holiday in Russia. Yeah. But if it is absolutely inconvenient, I think we can think about to change the date slightly. But I have to say, one week later, we tried to book the facility to accommodate all of you, but it was already occupied. So, <laughs> <laughs> so and uh, the suggestion is to have the meeting in Berlin this time, so that you have also the chance to visit the Fritz Harper Institute and uh, and the facilities there. So similar like we have done today here at the first. <laughs> So it would be uh, the 12th of uh, June. Would be Friday. Yeah? It's a Sunday. 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 So it's follow your, yeah, yeah, your yeah. schedule or your, sure, your sure. planning. Of we will see what happens. A little bit change, maybe maybe the gym. But to, uh, Sunday is a good uh, time, a uh, day for starting, like here we did it. Like this. Yeah. Okay. If you agree, just let me know. And if you think it's not. Convenient, definitely. We can really? think about to shift it by one or two weeks. So, one week later does not work, but maybe two weeks. <coughs> okay, we will see. We will do something. Yeah, but Berlin is a good location, and I'm sure that many, especially young people, can uh, go to the Fritz Cafe to see how it works. Yeah, and maybe we yeah, even older people can go there because yes. it's yeah, yeah. within walking <laughs> distance. <Yeah. laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Okay, in principle, I think we finish our seminar uh, with these uh, two lectures, uh, me and the Robert. Uh, originally, we decided to have no poster presentation and no uh, presentations for me and Robert. But we still continue to be without a poster presentation, but we made uh, two presentations in this seminar. Okay, uh, so I think we have uh, really, we had a uh, really fruitful uh, Days. Uh, we had a lot of, uh, not only the reports, but also discussions and uh, selective oxidation, as Robert mentioned, uh, on the biomass. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I am sure that we, we had a really great and good seminar uh, and a good tradition to organize such type of seminar, definitely. I am looking forward to the next one. <laughs> so, we can close this officially now. Maybe I can take Yes, sure. So I would like to use this opportunity to thank one more time all the people who are, uh, actively worked on the organization of, of this nice conference. So, in particular, Marina, she is not around for for yeah. very well reasons. I, I Maybe uh, many people did not know that um, Marina Suvoro just uh, became the second time by Ed Mazo. He, she, sorry, won the New Sound. Yeah, okay, in 22nd of June. Just one day before <laughs> our seminar, he promised. To, she promised to me to Very finalize the seminar and then go to hospital. <laughs> but the fate is the fate, you know. <laughs> so thanks to all people and also the people who have shown us here to the Voreskov Institute. The time that you, you spent for this is very much welcome, and I hope to see all of you, or most of you, maybe even more than the people here sure, in, sure. in Berlin. We are looking very much forward to this next. German-Russian seminar. German-Russian <laughs> seminar, you're right. <laughs> okay, so, thanks a lot for everybody, and for German for coming, and uh, to Russian participants to make a presentation, and good luck for everybody.